perhaps you could say a couple words just about um, you know what you do in your company or what your company does or what you do at the city uh, as we go through this. But um, we have we're going to start with kind of a, a big picture question about just what you think the number one biggest transportation challenges facing cities. Um, so let's uh, get started with that and. However, you, you want. Start? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I'm Tracy. I'm just here. I'm the president of Visicar. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge that we see is really around um, it's sort of a it's growth, right? And it's growth of um, urbanization. Cities getting more congested, more people. And for I think the stat is for um, each household, there's about 70% have owned a personal vehicle. When you think about how do you accommodate that growth, well, you, and the simple answer is, well, we just add more parking, add more curb space, expand our, our highways, and so on and so forth. And, but I think from a longer term view, it's not very sustainable, as, as we know. So that's why we're big advocates of sharing and 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 putting uh, driving or car sharing or any type of sharing mobility service. Would think, I think will be um, a, a solution. But to your point, there's other sort of the, how does that whole ecosystem work together? I think that's still a challenge. So. So uh, Chris, I go chair the mayor's office of urban mechanics. We're uh, we're an R&D lab, kind of based inside the city. Um, we work on a lot of transportation and street scape related projects. Uh, growth is going to be my answer, so I'm going to have to say three different things now. Uh, so I'll tie it back to the city recently went through a transportation planning process called Go Boston 2030. So thinking about our transportation future over the next 15 years, and the the three things that came out of that were um, safety, access, and reliability. Sort of three big targets uh, that people were sort of concerned with, right? So how do we make our streets safer? How do we make our transportation system both more accessible and more reliable? Um, and there's kind of three numbers that tie to that for me. Uh, the first is 22. So 22 people were killed on our streets last year. Uh, another 4,500 plus people were, were injured in crashes. 17.9, uh, which is a hard number to remember, but it is the difference between our high income and low income earners in the city of Austin. So the top 1% make 17.9 times more than the bottom 20%. So growing inequality in cities is a huge burden, uh, not just on, on housing, but also on transportation and what people are spending out of their uh, their wallet on transportation costs. Uh, and the, the last one is about growth. So uh, Boston is projected to be 724,000 people by 2030, right? For about 650,000. Right now we're in the highest uh, a pace of growth that we've been in, in the past 60 years. Uh, and we can't actually accommodate all those people to get into a car and drive somewhere. So we need to be uh, thinking about shared mobility, thinking about public transit, thinking about walking and biking. All right. I was not going to say growth. So it's a little easier. Than that. You say apps. I'm, I'm <laughs> um, yeah, Tyler George is a general manager of Lyft in New England. I, uh, I think most of you probably know what Lyft does, um, so I won't uh, get into that. But I'll get into my biggest problem, which I think is actually, this is kind of cheating maybe, because it's so broad, but infrastructure. Uh, you know, Boston, where I've lived pretty much my whole life, is still really a, a city that was built for what, horses and wagons. and. Um, luckily, someone had the foresight to take some tunnels and put some trains in, and that was popular. Um, but you know, even in the last five years, you look at you know, there's no such thing as Lyft. Uh, five years ago, there was no smartphones. Ten years ago, and just part 15 years ago, we're still dealing with the same infrastructure for the most part uh, that we that we had here in Boston 100 years ago. Uh, so you look at things like the transit system, which is pretty good, but underfunded, um, getting a little long in the tooth. Um, hard to find money to improve it, just do basic maintenance. Um, things like housing, right? So you'd love to have really dense developments in your transit hubs, hard to do. Um, you don't want to just tear down uh, you know, old neighborhoods. Uh, and then the infrastructure on streets is a big one, obviously, for companies like Lyft and Zipcar. Still, uh, left side and the right side of almost every street in Boston and around it are parked cars. And almost every mode that we're, that we're moving toward uh, doesn't doesn't require parked cars in the same way, uh, but it does require curb space, and that's going to be a very hard thing to change. All right, hi, Gretchen Afkin. I lead the business team at Autonomy. We build autonomous software systems uh, for cars. 
Uh, I think congestion is one of the things that I think the most about, in part because the initial ripple effect of reduced productivity, the amount of time that we spend commuting, and then secondarily, distracted driving as a result of slow commute times. Uh, you know, I bike commute every day, and every day I see people texting. My favorite was the guy who was balancing an iPad, reading the newspaper on his driving leg while driving, and so I think about this every day, like the effects of congestion means you're moving slowly, which means you get distracted and you know, you want to save time, you get a jump start on work, and then that causes uh, more accidents and leads to you know, catastrophic events, and so I think that congestion is really being one of the key things for cities in the time. How do you see Boston stacking up against other cities in the U.S. and and kind of how do you think it can um, like meet some of these challenges without destroying the the positive part of the infrastructure that it has? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things that's really exciting about Boston is just the breadth of innovation when it comes to transportation here. I think there's an incredible community with the car was founded, came out of this ecosystem. There are a tremendous number of transportation innovation companies here in Boston that are really pushing the envelope and encouraging people to have that multimodal shift in their mindset of being able to live a car light or a car free lifestyle. So I think that's something that Boston really stands out in terms of the top tier cities, uh, in terms of population, for sure. Um, second part of your question was around how do we continue to address the challenges while maintaining what's special about Boston. I think that's where we can really leverage some of the innovations that we're talking about. The more that people feel like they can go car light or car free, the more people you can flow through the system. And uh, so I think it's it's a two part having the having the multimodal available, but also the societal mindset shift uh, toward giving up giving up a car. And that's generationally hopefully easier uh, now than it's ever been. Yeah, I agree with all that, maybe to take it uh, in a different direction. I think that um, Boston actually has really good city governance, and the region as a whole actually does. There are some pretty notable exceptions. Um, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's actually true. I mean, I, you know, I've worked for the car for a while. I never dealt with governance of any stripe, and I had certain stereotypes about them. Um, and in this in this role, I'm in just a different sort of role, and I, I now meet people like Chris and uh, people at the MBTA and people in the, in the state government, and I've been so impressed with the the quality of uh, uh, people at sort of every level. And I, I work with a lot of people at, at Lyft who uh, you know who work with all sorts of cities across the country, and I know that that's not something to take for granted. Not every city is is run so well. You all probably are thinking a city or two right now that's not Boston that, that is sort of known for not being uh, not being on top of these things as Boston is. So that's a huge advantage for us. Plays out in a couple ways. I mean, you think about you know autonomous vehicles. You know, this area has been permitted for autonomous pilots. That's super cool. It's the city getting ahead of what we know is going to be a big part of the future here. Um, you look at you know, the transit agency, MBTA has been really forward thinking. Um, first uh, agency in the country to partner with uh, Lyft or a TNC for paratransit, um, which is a, a segment of transportation that could use a lot of work. Service sort of levels are uh, notoriously bad, it's very expensive. Uh, there's a million different pilots like that going on. Really interesting things happening at every level of uh, local government. So that's everything. Sort of I'm going to have a totally biased answer because I think Boston is probably the best city in the country, but I, I'm also paid to say that. <laughs> um, you know, we're incredibly lucky to have a great ecosystem. At, you know, we have a partnership with Autonomy, we have some stuff with Lyft, we have a partnership with Zipcar. Um, having sort of those uh, entrepreneurship uh, and sort of innovative companies in Boston that helps us actually uh, deliver better service to people and, and deliver against the goals that we're you know, being held accountable to by the public. Um, we also have great uh, advocacy partners, so you know, Walk Boston and Little Streets do a great job of sort of voicing concerns from constituencies through the city so that we make sure that we sort of hold true to what makes Boston uh, a really uh, unique sort of environment to live in and, and get around in. Um, one thing about how we you know, stack up against other cities sort of nationally, 
I think we do pretty well. If you ever travel somewhere that doesn't have a rail system or a good transit system or has 20 minute headways on buses, like it's pretty frustrating and you realize how good you have it. Now if you go to a city uh, that excels in this, uh, in Europe, or you know, if you're taking buses in Curitiba, or if you're on a train in Tokyo, like <laughs> all these places, you're like, well, we have a really long way to go before we can do that. But you know, when I look domestically uh, at Boston, you know, more than half the people in the city get to work every day uh, in something other than a single occupancy vehicle, uh, which is pretty impressive. When you know, when USDOT. Uh, gave away $50 million to Columbus, and you looked at their road splits, you could understand that they needed some help there. Um, right? Yeah. It's like 80% of people are driving to work. Um, so we didn't have the same scale of, of challenge. Um, you know, I, I think what was articulated in the Go Boston plan and what we've seen in Imagine Boston is like walking, transit, and biking are huge priorities for livability in the city. Um, so I, I think we're wrestling with you know, what Tyler referenced earlier around parking, there's, uh, we've got to do a paradigm shift from cars <coughs> and how we utilize the curb space. But we're, we're uh, you know, maybe five years into battling 100 years of planning in the cities uh, that were around the automobile. I think I'll echo some of what Tyler said about Boston being a, uh, a friendly city. And it's really, I think, been a big supporter of the car with Go Boston and some of those initiatives that really helped us grow in the city. Um, and, and I think, you know, having personally lived in um, New York, London, and Boston, I think I, I agree with Chris that, you know, when you can, depending on how you rank, uh, Boston probably still has a long, long ways to go. When you think about when I was living in London, you know, the congestion charge was introduced, which made a pretty significant impact on, on traffic in the central London. And, and that was, I think, over 10 years ago when, when that, that was introduced. And then you look at a city like Oslo that is um, banning, uh, uh, vehicle traffic in the downtown core, and that's also been in about 2019, which is right around the corner. So I think some of the European cities are nice uh, benchmarks in terms of how progressive they are on, on really making a dent around congestion and, and uh, sustainability. So 